What a glorious thing Jesus did for us by dying for our sins. The resurrection, his conquering death and the grave, his empty tomb, it cries out to each of us to find truth in this journey of life. You know, we're all on a journey, just like that video said. We're all on a journey going through this life. Only some of our lives will intersect with the empty tomb. I feel for those whose lives don't intersect with that empty tomb. I think that God desires for everyone at some place in their life to have that opportunity. This morning, you might be experiencing that cross-section for the first time in your life. Or maybe you're hearing about the empty tomb and the encounter with it for the very first time. You might be experiencing it for, like the video said, the hundredth time. It's kind of sad. I watched an interview the other day of people on the street, and they asked them what Easter was all about. People didn't even know it was about Jesus. They didn't know that it was about His death and His resurrection. They didn't know that it was about the Savior of the world coming to die for the sins of mankind. What a sad thing that so many in what we once called a Christian nation no longer have any idea that this day that we celebrate isn't about spring, it isn't about a rabbit, is isn't about candy, but it's actually about an empty tomb. An empty tomb where life truly begins. This morning, I'd like to focus on one verse of Scripture specifically. A couple of weeks ago, I started seeing this pop up all over Facebook. And I started watching people posting it. And sometimes I wondered if they understood what the true depth of it was. That scripture is found in Romans 8, 11. It says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let me read that again. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now it's funny because throughout the years a lot of churches and a lot of Christians have used this verse to talk about, well, if you're saved and God's Spirit is in you, then God will bring healing to, your, to these physical bodies that you're in. And, and there's truth in that. But in reality, this scripture that's on the scene before you, this scripture is the epitome, it is the, the, the fullness or the encumbrance of the truth of this gospel that we believe in, the resurrection. There are three aspects of this that I want to talk with you briefly about this morning. The first is Christ's resurrection. It says, but if the spirit who raised Christ from the dead. Now just so you're aware that we're on the same page, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. God is three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is the one who called forth Jesus from the grave when he was dead in the grave and buried for three days and rose him up from the dead in the grave. It is the center to our Christian faith. We know that Jesus died on Friday and that after he died, he descended into hell and he took the keys from death and hell and the grave, and he took them back from them, and he then ascended, and then he rose from the dead, and with him, all those who had been dead, but had been dead with faith in God prior to the cross, they too had resurrected and gone to, and come, some of the Bible says, actually walked the earth. And then, days later, Jesus ascended into heaven, 40 days later. You know, Paul writes about the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection. Are you aware today that there's actually more historical accuracy for the fact that Jesus lived and walked this earth than there is for a majority of kings that lived in the medieval periods? There's more fact, more history, more accounts that are given that Jesus truly was a man that came on this earth and actually died. And then the eyewitness accounts of his resurrection 1 Corinthians 3.8, Paul writes this. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at one time, at once of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. 
Paul's giving a record. He's accounting for all the people who saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. You know, sometimes we think it was just those couple of women who came to the tomb. But it was more than that. And then we think, well, maybe it was just his disciples. Well, it's easy to say his disciples would go out and say that he was risen, especially if his body had disappeared. We also see the account of Thomas, who said, I won't believe unless I can touch the nail scars in his hands, and who Jesus gave that opportunity to. But it was more. Jesus actually stopped, and some said, well, maybe it was just his ghost. Maybe it was just a spirit. But spirits don't eat. He actually stopped and ate breakfast and fish with his disciples on the beach. He stopped and he had lunch with disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then there was that time where he ascended into heaven, where over 500 people at one time, pretty hard to discount 500 people's witness, 500 people at one time saw him rise and ascend into heaven. Each of these were witnesses to Jesus being alive after his crucifixion. Some people like to say, well, Jesus didn't really die. He only swooned on the cross. Can I tell you how stupid that is? He swooned on the cross. I, I want to ask you, if you were up for two nights under such great anxiety that you were actually sweating blood, and then you were taken, and you were taken before three trials, and you were moved back and forth between, between Pilate and then the Sanhedrin Council, and in the middle of that, they beat you till you were bleeding and the blood was pouring out of off your back and your flesh was ripped from your body. And then if they force you to carry a cross, a mile up a hill called Golgotha, and force you to carry that cross uh, after you've been beaten to no end, you've been up now for 24 hours, you've had nothing to eat, you've had nothing to drink, you're bleeding profusely, you've been tried before people, people are screaming at you, they're spitting at you and mocking you. And then they take you, throw you onto this cross, nail Nails through your hands, not just little tiny nails, but gigantic nails through your hands, through your feet, stick you up to hang on a cross for hours. The physical ability to breathe hanging on a cross is so difficult that many just many would just die from their inability to breathe because of the way they would hang. If you have a crown of thorns on your head, and then if that doesn't top it all off. If they come and take a spear, stick it in your side so all the blood and water flies out of your body. And then, when they take you down, you've just swooned. Think about that. <laughs> if that's not enough, they're going to then take and they're going to wrap you in, in layers upon layers of linen cloth. They're going to wrap it all over your head and over your mouth. And then they're going to take pounds and pounds of stinky ointment. And they're going to smear it all over those linen cloths and your face. If you didn't die from swooning on the cross, if you didn't die on the cross, then you're certainly going to suffocate in that moment. And how on earth would he have enough strength to get himself out of those layers of cloth and actually fold his headpiece on the rock? If it weren't coming back from the dead by a miraculous power. You see, Jesus rose from the dead. He prophesied. He said that he would raise again after he had been dead for three days. He foretold that no other prophet ever said that they would die and raise from the dead. No other religious leader in all of history has such a proclamation, has such a claim. But Jesus. And you know, out of those people who saw him alive, his disciples, they all died for the cause. They were all tortured and martyred and killed for the cause. Few people will die for a lie. Chuck Colson wrote this, if you bring that quote up, William. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate, for those of you who are old enough to understand what Watergate was back in the Nixon era, proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Not just 12 disciples or apostles, but also many of those 500 people were killed in the Colosseums. They were martyred for their faith. The amazing thing is, 
And this is something I want you to stop and think about today. Maybe you're what we call CEOs, Christmas Easter only Christians. CEO Christians, have you ever? I, I had, don't be offended by that. I had a lady in one church who used to come every Christmas and Easter, and she loved the fact that I called her a CEO. But a Christmas Easter only Christians. Maybe you're a CEO, maybe, maybe your faith isn't very deep, but I want you to think about this. If Jesus really did raise from the dead, doesn't that make him worthy to be followed? Doesn't that make him worthy to be obeyed? Doesn't that make him worthy to be trusted in? Because you see, this resurrection, it's the climax to his life and his teaching. It's the fulfillment of prophecy that had been given thousands of years before. And if he fulfilled all of that, then he must truly be the Son of God. And if he is the Son of God who came to save mankind, doesn't he deserve our loyalty and our commitment and our following? Let's go on from Christ's resurrection. Let's talk for a minute about about my resurrection. Go like this. Touch yourself. Say my resurrection. The scripture verse in Romans 8, 11 says, If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, and we'll get to that in a minute, then it will quicken your mortal body. What that scripture is speaking of is about the physical resurrection that every man and woman and child, every person has put their faith in Jesus Christ. Every person that God's spirit dwells in will one day not just have spiritual resurrection in their spiritual life, but we'll actually have physical resurrection. Now some of you might be saying, well, why is that important? When we die, our spirit goes to be in heaven if we're serving Jesus. Because God created us as a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. And God's intent was when he completed his work was not to leave us partially fixed. He, wanted, he wants to complete the work wholly in who we are and how he created us to be. Now we know Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, Romans 6.23, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that every human being in this world, unless they are alive when Jesus returns for those who have their faith in him, we know every human being will die. Will die. Death is not the end of your faith. It's actually the beginning of eternal life. But because Jesus who conquered the grave, it's not only... Not only will our spirit man live, but one day our physical man will also be resurrected and live. We know that when we die now, our spirit goes to be present with our Heavenly Father. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But our true hope is that one day our body and our spirit are going to be reunited together and that this body is going to be transformed. You know what I'm really happy about? When this body's transformed, I'm going to be a size 32 again. I'm no longer going to have to struggle trying to eat paleo so I can try and keep a few pounds off my body all the time. My body's going to be raised. I'm not going to have aches in my feet or my back anymore. I'm not going to sneeze when the pollen comes out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have itchy fits because I get hives every night. This body's going to be transformed. I'm not just going to be a spirit being for eternity, but I am eventually going to be a resurrected, complete person who is whole. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 58 reads like this. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. 
It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever Useless. Anybody want to live forever? Yes. Anybody want to live forever? Amen. There's only one way. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I don't think it's right that people mistreat Islamic people or Buddhists or people who believe in paganism. or other I don't think it's ever right for us to mistreat anybody because God's called us to love. I think actually Christians are some of the most tolerant people because we actually don't go around beating people and killing people for those reasons like some other religions will do to Christians. But I will tell you this. I will never tolerate anything but the truth. And there's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. If you want to gain eternal life, if you want to live forever, and I don't know anyone who really wants to die, our physical body will die, but our spirit man will live, and then one day, like I said, they're going to be reunited. I don't know anyone who wants to go to eternal death, which is hell, but there's only one way to avoid it, and that's by having faith in Jesus Christ. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. You have a problem with that? Take it up with him. I'm just repeating what he said. Man tries to find eternal life through so many other means, but make no mistake, it's only in Jesus Christ. That's why his death and resurrection is so important to us. So let me talk about the third thing this morning. And then I'll let you be on your way to your Easter dinners. Christ in me. If we look back at Romans 8, 11, it says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it shall quicken your mortal body, or it will bring you resurrection life. So in order to experience that resurrection life, that spirit has to be within us. How does that happen? How do we get Christ in our life? We have to be born again. I think the, I think the latest term, excuse me, I think the latest term being used is rebirth. In John chapter 3, Verses 3 to 7, Jesus says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So, how do we become born again? It's when we confess our sins to Christ. It's when we recognize that we're sinners, that we've lived our life wrong, we've been selfish in our lives, and it's when we turn to God and say, Lord, I confess my sins to you. First John 1 John 1.9 says, when we do that, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we confess that sin to Jesus. It's like saying God. I've been on the throne of my own heart. I mean come on. Let's face it. We all do what we want to do for ourselves. Don't we? That's the way our, our sinful nature is. That's the way our earthly nature is. It's selfish. But it's saying okay God. I'm getting off the throne of my heart. Jesus would you take the throne. And sit there? Would you lead my life rather than me leading my life. I believe in your death. I believe in your resurrection. I want forgiveness of my sins. And Lord, I'm going to give you control of my life. 
Now, see, a lot of people, they come and they say a prayer, think that's enough, and they're getting into heaven because they want fire insurance. But fire insurance, it doesn't work unless you go hold out to the clauses. You know what I'm saying? What's the clause? That we give Jesus leadership in our life. And when we have that place of surrender, it's like this. In John 20, 21 to 22, before Jesus left this earth, he said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul recognizes that. He says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, in that moment that we surrender our hearts to King Jesus, in that moment that we surrender our lives, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in us. He comes and lives inside of us. He puts that spirit in us and that spirit is alive in us and he begins to transform our nature from that of the sinful man to that of a spiritual man. It's not something that just happens just because we say words. There has to be something where our heart is really surrendering to the Lord. And because of the resurrection, this is all made possible. In Colossians 1.27, Paul said this, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. You see, when we get born again, when we experience rebirth, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, in that moment we are born of the Spirit now, and our spirit man has changed. And our body awaits the day where it too will be transformed and resurrected just like Christ. We now have this hope of eternal life in the presence of God, eternal life in heaven. There is no purgatory. I'm sorry to tell you that's a myth. There is no purgatory. There is no other place to go except hell. We have the choice of heaven or hell, nothing else. And the only way we choose heaven is by choosing to surrender our life to Christ. And in that day that we do that, he promises to transform us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So complex and so simple. So complex and so simple. It comes down to this one thing. Will you surrender your life to Christ? As Christians, as those of us, Christians are not just someone who calls themselves by the name of Christ. Christians are not just something that says, that's the religion I identify with. A true Christian is one who is following Jesus Christ. They have surrendered their life to Him. And if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will quicken your mortal body. You will be raised again to life in that final day. That resurrection is not just for Jesus coming out of the tomb, but it's for every one of us to be completed in him. My question to you this day is, is the spirit of God dwelling in you?